layover. He awoke to the faint hum of lights in the yawning near silence of cavernous spaces, confused for a moment by his unfamiliar surroundings. The rows of drab seating, the shadowy high-ceilinged room with its vast swathes of empty floor, the broad banks of windows looking out upon the moonless night beyond. Then, as the weary wonder of sleep drew back and reality returned to him, he recalled the thirty hours of airport hopping and droning plane rides which had come before, and recognized his surroundings as those of Tokyo's Haneda Airport. That was where he was, seated in the third terminal, riding out his eight-hour layover upon the unforgiving plastic of a cheap bench in front of the gate his flight to Chicago was meant to depart from. But many, many things didn't sit right with him from the start. He'd drifted off around three in the morning, if memory served, the airport's little service desks and shopping alcoves mostly unmanned, and the lights dimmed for the sparse rows of sleeping travelers in the terminal. The lights remained dim, and the terminal remained quiet. And yet, even assuming his doze had been short and it was still well before dawn, it seemed far too quiet. Each moment's buzz from the dull lights far above him was a roar to his ears, and other than the crinkle of his jacket against the plastic of the bench, there came no other perceptible sound. He sat a long while like that, straining to stay still in the dark, listening for noises which did not come. No squeak of shoes on the tile or hum of luggage wheels on the carpet of the waiting areas. Just the hum of those dimmed lights and the sound of his own nervous breathing. At last he stood, trying not to seem panicked as he swung his head to and fro about the open spaces of Terminal 3. This grew more and more difficult, however, for the more he scanned, the more certain he became that he was alone in there. No slouched forms of drowsing passengers, no silent staff striding purposefully down the center walkways and no motion save the twinkling of electric signage. He nearly stumbled over after wheeling around and catching sight of his own shifting reflection in the nearby wall of windows, their surface mirror-like against the blackness outside. He turned about slower and slower for a long time, like a spinning door dragging to a languid halt, scanning his surroundings, but nothing appeared to alleviate his fears. Indeed, the fears in question only increased. On his third or fourth 360-degree scan of the sprawling temple of travel around him, he realized he couldn't see anything outside on the runway, either. Drawing up to the wall of glass on shaking legs, he saw through it a world far different than the one he remembered from before he'd drifted off. The sole light came spilling from the window walls of the terminal, pooling in sickly yellows and blues along the gray expanse of the tarmac below. Perhaps fifty or sixty yards was visible to him. The rest had fallen into shadow. There were no waiting aircraft, and there were no bustling ground crews. Where were the runway lights? The great towering overhead stood still and dark as steel toothpicks out there at the edge of his vision. Beyond the soft gleam of the light spilling from the airport itself, there were no twinkles of red and orange along the lanes that must still rest beyond the reach of his eyes. No planes coming into land in the distance, either. He pressed his forehead to the glass, as a child might, cupping his hands about his eyes to dull the ambient glow of the darkened terminal interior, and better scour the darkness. There were no stars, something he initially wrote off, as the night had been cloudy. But as his gaze lingered on the sky overhead, he saw it was a deep purple, almost black, which hung thick and motionless like some gargantuan tent roof above the silent scene. His eyes found the horizon then, 
and he saw that the distant outline of Tokyo across the water was the color of singed pitch. For a second, though he could hear only the electric drone of the airport's lights, he imagined he could hear the wind whipping down some surreal, abandoned street between high-rises, an imagined soundtrack more fitting for the empty canyonlands of Utah back home than the scuttling, insectile chaos of a multi-million man metropolis. For some reason, he felt the need to turn around the moment he perceived the city across the way was dark. Partially, this was to spare himself the uncanny sight of its premature ruin across the vast and obscure dark, but mostly it was because he felt he was in danger that having his back to the empty room was somehow a bad idea. Only when he made certain he was still alone did he take time to gather his thoughts. An earthquake, a tsunami, maybe. It'd have to be a bad one to knock out the power to the whole of Tokyo, though, and even if he wrote off the presence of dim lights and latent electronics in the terminal around him as emergency generators or reserves of some sort, that did nothing at all to explain away the absence of people. There would be damage from a disaster as well. Damage he saw no evidence of in the building around him, or the visible stretch of tarmac outside. Earthquakes didn't swallow people up. At least, not this way. Not all at once. Not quietly. The sky was otherworldly too, but he found that an easier qualm to bury. A strange celestial event he hadn't kept up with, certainly. A bad coincidence, for it to fall on the same night as whatever the hell was going on down on the ground. He found himself wondering what it was, taking just long enough to scold himself for not thinking of it before, and then digging into his pocket in search of his phone, which he quickly produced. It wouldn't turn on. His hand began to shake as he tried, so slightly he didn't even perceive the tremor himself. He almost cursed under his breath as he dragged the charger out of the backpack beneath the bench he'd slept on, strangling the sound halfway out and glancing about him as if he'd be spotted due to the noise. But the third terminal's third floor remained, as ever, empty, and he was left to plug in the phone at a nearby charging station in silence. He almost wasn't surprised when nothing happened. The screen did not light up and display a little percentage or a graphic of a filling battery. It did nothing, as if there were no battery in the thing at all. He jostled the adapter that linked the charger to the outlet, but to no avail. He then assured himself it was the outlet which was dead and pushed into a waiting area kiosk housing several softly glowing vending machines that dispensed full meals. He unplugged a functional microwave from the adjoining counter meant for heating the dispensed food and replaced it with the charger. And yet, still nothing happened. His last lifeline to any semblance of normalcy had been cut. Since awakening, he had confined himself to a small corner of the new empty world around him. Now, with no way to puzzle out what was going on from the relative security of his immediate surroundings, he was obliged to wander, to look for an answer he hadn't yet seen. This troubled him, and for a long while, he just loomed still over the bench with his backpack slung carelessly on, listening and looking for clues that were not there as he summoned the courage to move. There was a clock above the neighboring airline desk he saw, and unlike the many digital clocks that hung dark on the walls about him, this was a cheap-handed clock whose face hung still at half-past three. He had stared up at it with pleading eyes the entire time he gathered his thoughts and bravery, but it had never so much as twitched. At last, taking care to double-check his bag was secure on his back and wouldn't make much noise on the move, he walked off out of the waiting area, his cautious stride carrying him out of the rows of seating and onto the tiled central walkway of the terminal. The airport he'd entered hours ago was a very different place from the one he walked now. Sure, it had been uncomfortable, rumbling with the chaos of mixed voices and bustling in the span before midnight, 
as workers in the restaurants and stores of Terminal 3 had cleared out for the day. But, terrible as the tumult in Haneda had been before, the silence was many times worse. The darkened bathroom entrances and closed storefronts looming black like caves off to his left as he walked seemed the relics of an abandoned civilization, and though he'd felt like a fish out of water in the hours before his sleep, he now couldn't escape the feeling he'd been left behind. A melodramatic scenario played itself out in his mind as he walked, and he imagined some doomsday film scenario in which mankind had scuttled aboard rockets to flee the Earth, leaving him to walk the remainder alone. Of a religious rapture, so zealous it snatched everyone save him from the mortal coil. The absurd humor of it almost would have been comforting if the situation didn't seem so real. Yet, for all that solitude, every step echoed as if he walked the bowels of a cavern, and every breath came heavy with the expectation he was about to hear the silence broken by someone other than himself. There was something off, something strange. Some long-buried instinct whispered and nagged at him, told him he was not alone, that he needed to remain silent, that he was an intruder here. The animated neon head of a cat on a vending machine nearby winked at him sluggishly from the gloom of an alcove as it went through the motions of its eternal cycle, as if it were goading on his nervous paranoia. Soft as the sounds he made moving through the terminal were, the wholesale lack of intervening noise made them seem agonizingly loud. Eventually, he left the tile and moved over onto the carpeted spans flanking the waiting areas to his right, using the edge of the main causeway like a muffled sidewalk. Still, though, the noise seemed too much to him. Passing vacant help desks and looking in through the windows of equally vacant offices and staff rooms off the main causeway, he came to a wide sweep of stalled escalators and the stairs that flanked them. Some went downward to the second floor and beyond, while the others climbed upward towards the fourth floor. While there were dim lights on below and above him, the stairway itself was dark, a pocket of shadow in an already shadowed building. He fumbled for a few seconds in his bag, careful not to send too much noise into the darkness before him. He produced a paper map of the airport layout he'd picked up going through security and scanned it for a moment in the half-light. Only restaurants, overlooks, and entertainment above him, by the looks of things, leaving down as his only realistic goal. He tucked the map into a pocket, squinted hard into the shadows along the central downward stairway as if scrying for spectral attackers, and forced himself to begin the descent once he'd assured himself he was still alone. He emerged into another, equally sprawling space. Though he'd passed through the arrival lobby on the second floor hours earlier, his fatigue and the monotonous sluggishness of shuffling zombie-like from flight to flight made the layout hazy to him. The lighting didn't help, for while there were dimmed lights here, as there'd been on the floor above, they were more sparse. A few flickered in the distance down the halls and walkways, casting the ground beneath them into momentary obscurity before blinking back into life. He grazed the customs and security stations with his eyes and saw no signs of life there, nor was there any motion around the baggage claim half visible beyond them. One of the empty belts turned, though, slow and methodical, its scratchy sound dulled by the distance. He jumped when his eyes found a currency exchange booth near a car rental station, but he fast realized the dark figure outlined against the glass of the booth was a grinning cardboard cutout rather than a stationary lurker observing him. He caught his breath and once again resisted the urge to call for help or ask aloud whether anyone was there. Rather, he paced slowly from one area of the terminal's second floor to the other, drinking in the emptiness and poking his head into vacant restrooms and still offices to double-check that there was no one down here. Not only did he see no one, but he saw no leavings from anyone. No discarded coats or luggage, 
No abandoned coffee mugs or personal photos in the offices of the rental outlets, and no half-filled logs on the desks at customs. It was as if the whole of Terminal 3 was entirely new, as if, in some strange hiccup, he had arrived in a pristine incarnation of the structure where no human foot had ever tread. A hub for the teeming masses, forever silent, so icy in its lonesome state that even dust and the predations of vermin had never sought shelter there. He harbored the mad but undeniable impression that this airport, or reflection of one, was a thing removed from not just people, but from time. He crested the stairs down to the terminal exchange and bus stops on the first floor then, having spanned the whole of the second floor and found it empty. But it was even darker down there, almost subterranean. A lone light flickered somewhere off to the right of the stairway's end, just out of view, and in that drawn-out moment staring down that long, staggered slope to the first floor, he somehow knew something was wrong that he was not alone. Try as he might, though, he could make out no shapes in the dark down there, and could hear no noise which betrayed another person moving through the building. He had an impulse, or sensation, something akin to the feeling of an insect buzzing past one's ear on a still day, barely perceptible, but insistent. He turned to his right and looked out of a bank of windows upon the empty tarmac beyond, still vague and murky in the blackness that reigned beyond the building. But not wholly so. There was a light out there below him, he saw, yellow and sickly and bobbing low to the ground. It had the suggestion of life about it. He made for the windows. Some part of him told him not to go, to hide in the bowels of the terminal. But at the same time, he could not resist the need to see it, to see the sole other moving thing he'd glimpsed in all that silent stillness. He hugged one of the struts that broke the surface of the windows, craning his head around it like a deer peeking from behind a tree, and observed. What came shambling into the pale light that spilled from the terminal windows from the outer dark beyond was a wretched thing. It was small, something he discerned even at a distance. Its vaguely human body was paunchy, but its limbs were withered and frail. Its skin was dark as onyx, making it obscure in all but outline. Its arms ended in single, long protrusions with many joints that curled and writhed at its hips. The tips of these single fingers blinked in and out of orange and yellow life, looking for all the world like the luminescence of bloated twin lightning bugs. Its featureless head was lumpen and swollen, a few sizes too large for a figure of its size, it hung like a ripe fruit from a neck that seemed too weak to bear it aloft, and lolled side to side as the being shambled and bobbed into the muted light of the span beneath the window. It was the better part of a hundred yards away, down there, and yet the malformed thing jostled gradually to a halt and craned its head up toward the building, searching. It had to lift the head with its solitary fingers to complete this motion, so heavy was the hanging, eyeless mound upon its shoulders. But when that featureless thing stared upward, and he had no doubt that it was staring, the lights upon its fingers flared an angry scarlet. It had seen him, he knew, and at the thing's luminous signal, the shadows at the edge of the light out there on the tarmac slunk into motion. They were sluggish at first, jagged tears at the edge of the light as limbs black as the shadow slipped out into view. But before long, the whole of them came out into the light. They were as bleak as the first creature. These were giants, though, several times larger than a man, and lean as the crude stickmen a child might sketch on the eaves of a school paper. They had perfectly circular heads, not nearly so mangled as that of the first. 
They were as featureless as the little malformed thing which had led them out. The light spilling forth from the terminal seemed to warp around them, a barely perceptible thing that his eyes seemed to register as a shuddering or shivering along the outer edges of their bodies. All at once, at a twitching second signal from the stunted thing that struggled to stand at their feet, the giants began to run for the terminal. Things moved very quickly after that, but it took him some time to begin to move himself. His eyes were locked on the shivering little creature that had spotted him, its gleaming appendages seeming to pulse and blink with a languid anticipation. He only broke his paralysis when he heard glass shatter and thumping sound down on tiles of the first floor. Turning for the sweep down the second floor, he retraced his earlier steps, passing the yawning mouth of the customs section and wheeling onto the stairs back up to the third floor, where all this had started. Amidst the pounding of his feet, he heard thumping on the glass off to his side. As he emerged onto the third floor and wheeled to begin to climb towards the fourth, he looked over to the span of windows and saw countless wavering black outlines scuttling up the side of the building. The darkness at the edge of the light seethed with them out there, but he could not take the time to observe or ruminate on what it meant. Again, he began to climb. He emerged into a space which looked almost like malls back home with smaller retail stores and food court-like restaurants lining the walls. It wasn't quite as cavernous up here, and he felt less oppressed by his surroundings purely because he could see most of them. But the thumping on the glass and steel and concrete of the building continued, and amidst it, he heard the tread of heavy limbs ascending the stairs far below, echoing up to his ears to taunt him. He looked to the next upward stairway, to the fifth floor, the roof, and the viewing platform, which once would have given a broad scope of towering downtown, but there were already clattering figures climbing the windows here. Already the sounds of fracturing glass sounded above as things which seemed to shiver against the world about them pushed unseen into the terminal, pushed in to get him. He had a clarity which felt almost mad then, they didn't need to find him. They knew exactly where he was. Hiding in a bathroom or tucked under a store counter would do him no good. It would merely delay the inevitable for a few scant seconds, as the things chasing him closed the distance. He didn't know why he knew these things with such certainty. He knew only that they were true. A wave of paradoxical acceptance swept over him like a warm breeze, and suddenly he was not so afraid. He moved to the windows amidst the clatter of the pounding stick limbs and the tumult of giants climbing and descending stairs to reach him. In his last moments before they did reach him, he gazed out over the blackness that had once housed the runways and the water beyond. He picked out the jagged silhouette of the pitch-dark city that stood half-visible against the horizon out there. He saw the great forms of spindly titans skulking amongst the buildings, their bodies as featureless as the crude creatures that even now tore through the terminal, and their outlines humming and flickering with the same strange aversion to light. He wondered, for a moment, whether they too knew where he was whether all the beings in whatever nightmare shard of existence he stood upon had found the interloper and were coming to intercept him. To wonder one last time whether he was truly the only person left. But the noise of pursuit was at his back now, and he did not wonder for long.